All right. So as you know, Reverend Tim is at home relaxing. He is watching right now. I'm going to shock at him. I'm hoping you're feeling better soon, Reverend Tim. And uh, we are all about faith right now. So I know Reverend Tim was going to talk about uh, we have come this far in faith. That was his uh, message title. But because tomorrow is uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, 95 years old he would have been, uh, I feel to celebrate not only these accomplishments, but to look at how far we have come, but yet what is it that actually has got us this far? And it goes in alignment, or it's in alignment with this month's power, faith. But I was also reading, when I was looking at scripture, every once in a while I'll open up that Bible of mine, and uh, it says that faith without works is dead. So you can have as much faith as whatever out there, as big as you want to make it, but without actually doing the work, without actually going out there and showing the universe that you believe in what you believe, and then you're going to prove it through an actionable step, then it means nothing. So I'll read a quick scripture. It's from James chapter 2, verse 14 through 26. It says, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus, also faith by itself does not have works. It is dead then. If we are not willing to do an actionable step to help each other out, then why are we here? What is your purpose here in this life if not to make this world a better place? We have people who are givers, and then there's a lot that are takers. They use resources, time, energy. They'll be chatting on the phone with you for hours and hours, telling you problems taking away your time, but not doing anything to positively affect change in their own lives. And so those are the energy leaks in our life. And if we allow those things to go unquestioned, then we ourselves become just another, I guess, just another sad story. If we're not out there doing something, and first of all, it starts within ourselves. So faith without works is kind of like having a car with no driver, though. Well, I mean, you can get everywhere you want to go to. I mean, on this island, you can't go, you know, to Cali or anything like that. But you can get to where you need to go to get things accomplished. If you have a car, it has some gas in it. But without a driver, it just sits there. And without someone doing something, taking an actionable step in their lives with faith, then it just remains potential, and that's it. And some of us are living a faith that is, how would I put this? Well, it's like our parents' faith. So some of you may have grown up with, there was not enough food, there was not enough this, resources, money, clothing, whatever. You may have grown up with parents that believed that there was too much, uh, they had faith in a lot of diseases, illnesses, sicknesses. I know, and I've told this story before, when I grew up, I always, for some reason, I'm canceling this right now, but um, I had this belief in strep throat. And I look, if I didn't have socks on while going to bed, the next day I would wake up with strep throat. And it was crazy, but it happened all the time. I stayed in bed, I think, the age of 10 because I just had that belief in my head. Now I can't stand to sleep with socks on. I, look, you can't make me. I don't care how cold it is out there. Not even this week. Look, this weather's crazy, but not even this week. You will not find me sleeping with no socks on. So, because I have gotten rid of that belief. 
that something out there, if I do something, something will happen, or that socks have the ability to keep a virus from me or a bacterial infection or what have you. Um, and some of us are living in the faith of not only our parents, but the faith of the doctors, the faith of CNN. How many people uh, turn on the news daily and just let the faith of CNN dictate how you're going to feel about this world? I, there's some people hiding out here. Oh, we got, we got see the one, one guy. Look, thank you for being honest, the only honest man in here. So, look, the, and, but it's the truth. Uh, a long time ago, I used to care give for an older gentleman. And I saw over the months, progressively, as his intake of uh, news, media increased, so did his ailments. You, look, oh, and I kid, kid you not, I would walk in, he'd start watching CNN. He'd get mad that they didn't agree with him, so he'd go to MSNBC. Get mad at them, and then he wanted to just fight with themselves, so he'd turn on Fox News. And so it was just a battle. But his faith was in what he was hearing. And so I asked, I said, you know, why do you watch the news if it just upsets you? And the, by this time, when I had finally asked, he was bedridden. He had horrible arthritis, just could barely walk. And I said, do you feel like you could do something about it? He's like, well, I just want to know what's out there. And I started to look at his condition. The more, like I said, the more he, he was watching the news and he was talking about it and living, he couldn't believe that this was happening that, and he was so upset. And, but he kept on just circulating that within his own thought system. And I started to see, like, maybe there is a correlation between what we are feeding ourselves, because it's all food. Yeah. It's all food. And so if you're watching something, uh, uh, war, disaster, what have you, 24-7, your body, every single cell of the body is listening death, destruction, what do you think that is doing on a cellular level to you? If you want health, then put your faith, put a little bit of your time into doing things that are healthy for you. Maybe read a good book or two, a happy news story. There are news out there that do uh, just tell about the good news, the miracles and everything else. And so you can find it if you look for it, but it's so easy to become inundated and the world wants you to become inundated with what's happening in the East and the West and the North and the South. And this is a call as spiritual beings to not fall under that hypnosis because you're starting to place your seed of faith in something little by little. Little by little, it'll start to, the fear will start to creep in. And you'll be left in a state of despair. You'll stop believing in miracles. You'll start to experience things going awry. If you feed yourself food that is not good for you, the outcome the outcome is going to be certain that things are going to start to break down. Now, when we look at faith, I find most oftentimes, I mean, and maybe this covers the whole gamut of things, but we look at the financials, we're looking at where people start to experience difficulty in trusting in God and putting their faith in God when it comes to, let's say, financials or relationships or health. And so when we look at the, let's say, financial aspect, how many people would agree that you are working for God and for God only? Not IBM, not McDonald's, not the car wash down the street. Well, I would like to just try to uh, maybe give a, a little bit of a point as to how that is so. When I started working on this sermon yesterday, I, um, in realizing that tomorrow was uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, I remembered that I had this book. It's called A Gift of Love. 
And most people remember uh, just, you know, I have a dream speech. But there are so many sermons that he has given that are just filled with nuggets of truth. And I finally opened, it looks like I've been reading it forever. I've had this for a couple of months, but uh, for some reason it's been worn and torn. And when I finally opened it up yesterday, I was just completely immersed at the stories, the sermons, the examples that he used to illustrate faith in action. And he went on to talk about faith in financials, how we're all interconnected. In his sermon, he was saying, God is able. He was saying, or our God, God is able. He was looking at how God can do things that man cannot even do. He says, our God is able. It is faith in him that we must rediscover that this faith we can transform bleak and desolate sails into sunlit paths of joy and bring new light into dark careers. In someone here moving toward the, or someone here moving toward the twilight of life, and is fearful that of what we call death, why be afraid? God is able. Is someone here on the brink of despair because of the death of a loved one, the breaking of a marriage, or the waywardness of a child? Why despair? God is able to give you the power to endure that which cannot be changed. Is someone here anxious? Why be anxious? Come what may, God is able. And when we look at how God is able in our lives, whether it is with the financial situation, whether it is with our relationships, whether it's with our health, we start to see that at times we've been placing seeds of faith into something that is counterproductive to where we want to be. When we start to look at what we are intaking, and you can tell what you're intaking by what's being output. The intake and the output will correlate with one another. If you have faith in lack, if you have faith in dis-ease, if you have faith in dysfunctional relationships, you will see that manifest itself in your life. There is no other way. Life is one big mirror, and your faith will be able to or will be shown to the world of what you truly believe. Remember, an apple tree will only produce apples. You will not find an apple tree producing oranges. Not, not here. I don't, maybe in other countries they do, but here they don't. And when people think of faith, they also think of, oh, faith in something good. But no, you can have misdirected faith. Like I said, if you are putting your faith into something that is negative, you will see it manifest in your life. There are a million and one possibilities out there. Why is it so often that we choose some of the bleakest possibilities? Now, I'm going to tell on myself real quick. Uh, because I found, I see, I'm up here preaching, but there's a little bit of a backstory because even I, at times, find myself um, going and moving towards fear. So this past Tuesday, I went to the doctors. I very rarely go to the doctors, but when I do, I do. And they were just running routine uh, exam or whatever, and they did an ultrasound. And the doctor... Uh, you know, I'm looking at the face, you know, I'm just always getting my cues by the expression. And he started to look concerned, like puzzled. And he says, uh, did you have this certain organ removed? <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was like, what? He's like, do you have this or did you have this organ, sur this one organ surgically removed? And I said, no. He's like, well, I can't find it. <laughs> I think, could you not wait? All of a sudden, my mind went into a story. I was like, I must have been drugged one day. And then they came in, took it out of me. And now it's on the black market. I went into a movie. There was so much. I, I didn't know what was happening. And suddenly I found myself 
wondering where this organ was and how much, which vigilante I was going to have to pay to get it back and how much it was going to cost me. And I kid, no, and I kid you not, that's exactly what happened. And maybe, I don't know how long the time passed. It could have been two hours. It could have been 10 seconds. Finally, he's like, oh, there it is. Okay. And I'm like, <laughs> I was horrified. But how quickly my mind went from faith to fear. I mean, in a, a millisecond, made up an entire award-winning movie to explain why I didn't have a certain organ anymore. Well, I'm telling you, look, y'all, look, it, it is real to struggle sometimes. And so when I come to you and say, yeah, faith, this, look, it, it happens to the best of us. And when, when they can't find an organ of yours, <laughs> mine goes wild. So that's what happened. And I started to chuckle to myself because I'm one of those people, you know, I do, like I said, I look for social cues. If I'm on an airplane, it doesn't matter. We could be flipping upside down to as long as the stewardess is smiling and serving. I'm okay. But as soon we could just hit a little bit of pocket of air. And as soon as I see a frown and that I get all nervous. So, you know, it's, it's work. And so this is, those are opportunities for me to remember to lean into God with my faith that God is my source. God is my supply. God is my protector and is an ever present help in my time of need, whether it is on the, you know, examining table or 40,000 feet in the air, whether I'm in the ocean or sitting on my couch reading a book, that nothing, my relationship has not changed with God at all. God doesn't flip the mind like that. My mind flips quite constantly, but God remains the same. When there, there's over 7,000, almost 8,000 prim, promises in the Bible, believe every one of them. That God is here for your good. That his promises go on out before you. That he makes crooked places straight. Start believing in the good in life. Put your faith in that. Withdraw it from the news. Withdraw it from the gossip. Withdraw it from the bank account. And put it into God. When we can do that, when we can just look to that presence instead of looking to the appearance, because there's a difference between the presence and the appearance. Things may pop up. They often will. And that's okay. We are called to then lean upon him, that he cares for us. That our safety and our security is assured in him. And those times that we face challenges are opportunities for us to grow deeper in the trust, deeper in our faith, knowing that it is unwavering, that nothing should be able to move us. So tomorrow we're celebrating Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And in reading the various sermons in the book, I had to, again, chuckle to myself because he pointed to three things that really it takes in order to survive in this world, in order to just even make it day to day. Each one of us possesses this but to varying degrees. Each one of us possesses some amount of courage. It takes courage to get up out of bed, to face the day, to go to work sometimes, to deal with the kids, to go to that new interview, to meet new friends. We all have at least this much amount of courage. The second he expressed was love. That there's some degree of love in each one of us. 
that each one of us, because we were born in the image and likeness of that which created us, we have to be at the very essence of our being, this love, this reflective state of good. It's just that we may have forgotten. And then the third, he said, was the faith. That each one of us, every day, has faith in something. That we walk around, whether it is, and I know you've heard this one before, but if you're starting your car, you have faith that, hopefully, most of you, uh, have faith that it'll start uh, once you put the key in the ignition. Or faith that the sun will rise again. We all have that within us to move us forward each and every day. It's just how are we utilizing it? Are we utilizing it to progress us as an individual, as a community, as a nation, as a global community? Or are we using it in another way where we're misplacing it? If we take a look at the state of affairs in our world today, what comes up for you internally? What feelings do you feel? Is it disdain? Is it sadness? Is it joy? Could be a mixture of things. There's a lot happening. But if we can remember that we're all interconnected to some degree, and he spoke about this in his, uh, one of his sermons inside this book, A Gift of Love, that there is no way any one of us can do anything on a day-to-day -day basis without relying on somebody else in this world. Whether it's the soap you used today, the phone that you're on, the clothes that you're wearing, you are relying on someone in some part of the world to provide a service as they are you when you go to your job. We are all here to help one another, whether we see it or not, whether we realize it or not. I cannot do something over in point A without a point, uh, affecting point B. It's no way, no how. We don't even see the impact that we do or what that we have on a day-to-day -day basis of how we are either negatively or positively affecting lives around the nation and around this globe. But we are. When you show up to whatever job that you have, you might be making a product that may end up in Indonesia somewhere helping somebody else out. So when we look at why we're here. No matter if you're flipping burgers or writing policy, remember that your job is important. Put your faith in that God particle within you, that you are doing something important, that you are positively making a difference by showing up, and that ultimately you're doing it for God that we're all ministers. It doesn't matter what our job is, to show up and just do it for the one that has given us life. Our product will go on to benefit those and the love will be shared with that. It doesn't matter how small or how big. There is a difference that you can make in this world. You can show up to your job tomorrow with a renewed sense of purpose if you realize that ultimately you're just there for God and for God only. That ultimately whatever you're doing is going to have a positive impact on somebody that you may never meet. That you are fulfilling a mission of mankind, of humankind, just by being present. And Dr. King realized this. In his sermon, uh, Our God is Able, he spoke about how he had an easy upbringing. Things went pretty smooth up until the Montgomery 
uh, bus incident where he would protest, where he was called into leadership. Up until that point, he had an okay life and not too much stress. Suddenly, his family and him began to receive death threats. And with those death threats, he began, at first, he didn't think too much of it. But on a particular night, he was very weary. He wanted to get to bed. And the phone rang in the middle of the night, and he answered it. And basically, another death threat had come in. And so he writes, I got out of bed and began to walk the floor. Finally, I went to the kitchen and heated a pot of coffee. I was ready to give up. I tried to think of a way to move out of the picture without appearing to be a coward. In this state of exhaustion, when my courage had almost gone, I determined to take my problem to God. With my head in my hands, I bowed over the kitchen table and prayed aloud. The words I spoke to God that midnight are still vivid in my memory. I am here taking a stand for what I believe is right, but now I'm afraid. I have people that are looking to me for leadership. And if I stand before them without strength and courage, they too will falter. I am at the end of my powers, God. I have nothing left. I've come to a point where I cannot face it alone. And he writes, at that moment, I experienced the presence of the divine as I'd never experienced him. It seemed as though I could hear the quiet assurance of an inner voice saying, stand up for the righteous righteousness stand up for truth god will be at your side forever almost at once my fears began to pass me my uncertainty disappeared i was ready to face anything the outer situa situation remained the same but god had given me inner calm three nights later our home was bombed Strangely enough, I accepted the word of the bombing calmly. My experience with God had given me a new strength and trust. I knew now that God is able to give us interior resources to face the storms and problems of life. Let this affirmation be our ringing cry. It will give us courage to face the uncertainties of the future. It will give our tired feet new strength as we continue on forward in stride toward the city of freedom. When our days become dreary and low hovering clouds and our nights become darker with a thousand midnights, let us remember that there is a great benign power in the universe whose name is God. And he is able to make a way out of no way and transform dark yesterdays into bright tomorrows. This is our hope for becoming better men. This is our mandate for seeking to make a better world. He had faith that when he received that connection with God, that he was on purpose. Days later, his house was bombed. But that did not dissuade him because he knew who stood Besides him, in front of him, behind him, underneath him, and on top of him. He understood the presence that he was working with. And that experience was the experience that allowed him to continue on going further. To do it with courage. To lead people, to lead a nation, to do what was right. He put his faith in God, not into that telephone call, not into the bombing, and not into the death threats. When we lean on God in faith, no matter how big or how small, no matter how grand or trivial our problems may be, there's a man who demonstrated the courage that it takes to put faith in action. He didn't sit with that knowledge with that revelation, he went out there to make a better difference in this world. Each one of us is called to make a better difference in this world, to live in faith, to do what is right, to make a positive difference, to move forward. Your call may look different 
than Dr. King's. My call may look different than yours, but ultimately, because of our interconnectivity, we are called to the same purpose, and that is to make peace with everyone in this world. I want to do a quick exercise before we go into meditation. I want you to have your palms kind of just clasped right here. And I want you to think of something that you're just willing and ready to release. A fear, something that deserves God's, God's faith, your faith, that something good will happen. So whatever that situation is, I want you to speak it into your palms right now. And once you're done speaking, keep it clasped. I want you to feel that energy. Whatever it is, that burden is no longer yours. Your hands are wrapped in faith that God is already taking care of it. And now with a swift up into the air, I want you to release it and bless it. Make sure you don't throw it on the guy next to you or the girl. <laughs> they don't want your problem either. But you've released it. And any time fear comes to you, you can do that. You can physically feel it and then release it. That's another action step that you can take. And so now I invite you as we take this time to just go into the silence of our very being. And we breathe in to a new way of walking in faith, of doing the work, knowing that our faith in God's good It's just waiting for us to say yes. To say yes to the blessing. To the million and one good things that God has already on your path. That the fears, concerns of yesteryear need not apply today. That you are free. You are free from any bondage. From anything that has held you back, that at any time you can release it and put your faith back into the one that knows all things, sees all things, and does all things. And breathing in and just allowing this time to be in communion with that one presence and that one power to have a conversation with the one whose ears are always listening. Let us take this into the silence. And we awaken the senses, remaining in that prayerful state that that faith that abides as us is enough to move mountains, to heal relationships, and to transform this world.